All right, good morning. Happy Sunday. Today we are going to look at one verse and one verse only. Well, we'll look at a lot of verses, but we're going to focus on John 8 and 12. It's an amazing passage, as they always are, that Jesus says so much with so few words. It's amazing. We're going to really look forward to it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. We thank you for the people that you brought to life this week. We thank you for the people that you provided for this week. We thank you for your love and your direction. Be glorified this hour. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So what's this weekend? Labor Day. Labor Day. What's next Friday? Patriot Day. Next Friday is 9-11, and it's the day that we celebrate Patriot Day. I was privileged to be asked to sing for the uh, City of Corsicana's Patriot Day celebration, um, which has been pre-recorded so that you can enjoy it um, on your own. And I thought this song might be appropriate to sing this weekend. I can hear it. So I'm going to go help. This sounds almost an idea. to the beginning and we're good to go. Just move that little slide back. There you go. Yay for the sound team.
Thank you, Joanna, for that wonderful song. You know, uh, this song we're fixing to sing is To God Be the Glory. And we, we talk, hear a lot of talk about today about make America great again. Well, you know something? God made us great to start with. And it will be God that's going to allow us to be great again if we acknowledge him in what we are doing and what we're saying and what we are believing and what we're standing for. Let's look to number 340, To God Be the Glory. Well, I said the wrong number. 
Lord, I just surrendered everything to him. All right, let's get this going. What can I give to you? Till that one course, then I just had to let you go with it. You got a little high. You got some range there. Hey, how about Jennifer on the bongos? Yay. Her one armed husband back there doing the, the media. Yay. That's when people love Jesus, man. Do ministry with one arm. I'll let me see. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the day. Speak to us through your amazing word. Speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Let us have eyes to see, ears to hear. Let the response of our heart to you always and ever be yes. In Jesus' name, amen. So I talked about it last week. I talked about it in uh, the church practice, uh, I think, last Saturday. But 
the, what we talked about last week about the lady taking in adultery, that passage is not in the oldest manuscripts, but it has remained in our Bible, and you probably have it in brackets. And my opinion about that is that it's probably something, because John was a longtime pastor of Ephesus, and I believe that probably what happened was somebody found it among his writings and chose to include it later. There's no reason to believe it's not scripture. Um, they put it where they thought that it fit, but in doing so, it kind of interrupted the narrative of Jesus in the temple um, at the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Booths. So when we pick up in verse 12, we're kind of taking up where we left off in verse 52 of chapter 7. So you'll remember that the week-long Feast of Booths was a celebration of Israel being in the wilderness and being provided for by God. And there were several aspects of this feast that were specifically intended to remind the people of the time that they were in the wilderness waiting for the land to be provided to them. And they lived in booths, they lived in tents, um, they had temporary housing. God gave them water when they were thirsty uh, at Meribah. Out of a rock, God, the water was provided. And remember we talked about the where they would pour the water out of the pitcher onto the, the altar, and that was a picture of that water that was provided. And in this passage, we have um, a second aspect of that ritual that is very significant, and that is the light. And so Jesus makes a statement coinciding with this practice, and we'll talk about the significance. But let's go to uh, John 8, 12. And it says very simply, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So much is being said in so few words. How many of you used to be either football players or good at football games? So you know what it's like to be a little ways off. And particularly if it's a country, if you're in the country, and there's a football field somewhere, and you see those lights from miles away, right? There's a whole TV program called what? Friday Night Lights, right? Because it's significant, right? I mean, you can see it from everywhere. You know it's football time. If you forget that it's football time, and you're in a place where there's a football field, you look at it, you see the lights, you go, oh, it's football time. In the temple, were giant menorah, two, three-story menorah, had to have the a long, tall ladder to get up there and light it, full of, full of um, oil. And at dusk, the Levites, whoever, would climb these ladders and light these giant lamps that would become so bright that the light from these lamps would reflect off the gold and the white stone of the temple. And everywhere around, the whole, where everybody lived, the outlying areas, you could just look up to Jerusalem and see like a light show, just like a beam of light. It's called the Diamond of Jerusalem. It shone so much that it, it, it was actually diamond-like, the refracting of the, the light and the, and the, the gold and, the, and, and just the, it was a light show. And it was amazing to behold. And particularly in this feast, they brought in even more of these lamps. And the reason they brought these lamps in was to signify the pillar of fire that the people of God followed to be directed by God. And so you already had these giant two, three-story menorah, but for this particular feast, after the pouring of the water, you had the bringing in of all these additional lamps. And there was this amazing light show, and the power and the presence of it was to remind the people that when, even though they were in a wilderness place and they were being led by God day by day, they, that fire told them where to go. And Jesus in the court of women, where most of the people would be gathered, because that's where 13 trumpets were, and trumpets were boxes. And on the top of the box was something that looked like a spittoon. And people would go in and place the money in those boxes. And the money would go in and make noise, and you could hear it going down. That's why Jesus says, don't blast the trumpet when you give. Don't go in there and just make noise, you know, throw a bunch of coins in and that, that's one reason he said that. But this was a place that everyone had access to, the, the court of women. And so these lights were there where everyone came and went, and, and most of the crowd was there. And probably and possibly at the very moment 
that these lights are being lit. And you can imagine that that would be quite a spectacle. You can imagine that at the point of the lighting of these multiple uh, sources of light that people probably stop to watch. It would be like us watching a helicopter land. You ever notice when a helicopter lands, everybody just stops and watches just because it's cool, right? You can imagine that at this event, everyone stops and they just watch. And, and if they don't, they, they respond because the place lights up. It just lights up. Probably at the moment of the igniting of the light, Jesus speaks. And he says again, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, notice his words, he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so the significance of the setting of Jesus' proclamation is the feast, the lighting of these great lamps. It's actually called by the Hebrew people by the Jews, it was called the illumination of the temple. It was an illumination ceremony, illustrating post-exile encounter with God, whereby God says, follow me. I'm going to show you where to go. Follow the pillar. Cloud by day, fire by night. God is a God of revelation. Are you wondering what to do? Pray. God is not... We have mysteries. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. There's some things we don't know about. This is the 20th anniversary for Daniel. Daniel will be 20 years old this week. Daniel would have passed on the 8th of this week. We buried him on 9-11. One year later, the towers fell. Young man, I don't see him here today. Young man that visited last week was born on 9-11-2000. That was crazy. I looked at that. Anyway, that's interesting. Just interesting. The thing, little things that God does. Post-exilic encounter with God, pillar of fire, God will direct. God will show us. God loves us. It's his plan that we follow him. It's his plan that we look to him. And he will give you indicators. He will give you leading. And so Jesus makes a twofold proclamation just by the very thing that he said. You just read it, and it just sounds like this, this statement. But his words were pregnant. His words were full. His words were heavy. When Jesus says, I come to give you life and to give it to you abundantly, the word abundantly is heavy. And I went to Aldi the other day, and Aldi was all out of plastic sacks, the ones that I wanted to pay for. They got the really high dollar plastic. I don't want to overpay for plastic sacks. So I got old school paper sacks. And those of you that remember grocery shopping when paper sacks is all we had, you know when you put too much in there, right? You know, you're holding it to Bob. You're praying it doesn't tear over here. You put a pointy thing over here. You know you're in trouble on that side. And you're just trying to keep it from falling apart, right? And that's the word abundant. God wants us to have full lives. He wants us to have heavy lives. Not in a sorrow way. He wants us to have meaningful lives. And so God makes a twofold proclamation in the way that he describes himself. And, and he says two things that were instantly recognizable by the people there. We know that because of how they responded. After Jesus makes this, this statement, they instantly come back at him. Your testimony is false. They, 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 they were ignited by his words. And so, I guess I got a deer in the front. I think that's what that noise is. Anyway. <laughs> Ego, I me, in the Greek. He says, he says, I am the light of the world. This is one of seven I am statements. When Jesus chooses the words, I am, he's choosing the tetragrammaton. How do we know that Yahweh was a name of God? Is it because he signed up on Google and he made his email, Yahweh, from the beginning at gmail.com? So we know, right? That's how we know his name. Yahweh, the words in Hebrew, literally the, the, the Y-H-W-H, literally do mean the I am that I am. That's what it means, okay? And there's, there's an E-H-W, there's a, there's a first person and a third person, but that I am is the name that was, from that point on, attributed to God. That's, that's where we get Yahweh. Jehovah was a derivative to try to be a little bit yet less Yahweh and kind of honor the Jews who wouldn't pronounce the name. And uh, I think when you look in your King James and some other Bibles, it's Lord with all caps. There's ways that's been written in English to try to honor the Jewish tradition of not speaking that name because it was so holy. But Yahweh, those, that, 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 those letters 
are, in fact, I am. So when Jesus comes out and says, I am, and he starts to sing us that way, they know immediately what he's saying. Jesus, by using that terminology, is declaring deity. He is saying, God, me, God, the light of the world. When Jesus called himself the light of the world, after just having called himself God, he's done something very bold, and he's done something very direct. Because any Hebrew scribe or any Hebrew scholar knew the book of Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, the Messiah is identified with light. Let's look at Isaiah 42.6. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. I will appoint you as a covenant to the people and a light to the nations. Is there more of that verse, or does we just go to the next one? Okay, so there's one. Isaiah 42, uh, so Isaiah 49 says. Very good. He says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant? The word is literally slave. Christians are referred to as slaves of Jesus in the New Testament. Interestingly, in the Old Testament, Jesus, the Messiah, is referred to as a slave of God. Very interesting. That you should be my slave, literally, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. These are two prominent passages. There are other passages. Uh, these are not the only passages. But these are two prominent passages. And anyone that ever studied the Old Testament would understand that Jesus here is not only declaring deity, but he's declaring himself the Messiah, the one that they've been waiting for. He stands up in the middle of this dramatic feast, this dramatic event, and he steals the show. He says, I am huh, the light of the world. He might as well have just come out and say, I, God, am the Messiah. That's exactly what he meant. That's exactly what he meant. So I think of this. We know what the Bible teaches. We know what we believe. We know those of us that have said, Jesus, I believe you're God. Forgive me for my sins. I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sins. Let that count for me. I surrender my life and I follow you with my life. We know what that is. And we're going to see... An amazing statement here that Jesus says about the path and the progress of the justified and what that's supposed to look like. If you're really a Christian, what that looks like as opposed to posers, as opposed to fans of Jesus. Who's a follower of Jesus versus a fan of Jesus? There's a book, not a fan. You got to get it. It's a good book. It talks about, for about 120-something pages, the distinction, the difference between being a fan of Jesus and a true follower of Jesus. A lot of fans of Jesus. A lot of people tip their hat to Jesus. A lot of people check a box, respect Jesus. But to follow Jesus is another thing. And if you're his and he's yours, you will follow, you will follow him. And John is explicit about this, particularly in his letters. He cuts us no slack at all. If you say you're his and you're not walking with him, you're lying. It's kind of hard. The average Christian couldn't stomach that. The average Christian would say, well, you just don't understand. Now he understands grace. He, he was the, the, the apostle that, that Jesus loved. He understands it. He's just saying, you are what you do. And that's reality. And so, <clears throat> before we go that far, I've preached another point. Let's go back. What does it mean for Jesus to be our light? I just got thinking about it. What does it mean? What does it mean that Jesus is our light? It means so much. First of all, it speaks to his character. Majestic. First John, I'm sorry. No, John, verses 1 through 14. The majestic nature of Jesus as God. And this is where... This is a Christological passage. John is expressing to us from the very beginning. Let's go to John 1, 5. 1, uh, 1 through 14, actually. Let's go to John 1, 1 through 14. And I can turn to it if I need to. Oh, we're there. Okay. In the beginning was the Word. Oh, I've got mid-timer's disease. The Word was God, and the Word was with, uh, and the Word, excuse me, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Go ahead. I'm sorry. He was in the beginning with God. 
All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. You see that? You see the relationship? Okay, go ahead. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all may believe through him. He was not the light. He came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the world became flesh, the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, the majesty of Jesus. And so John begins his letter, he begins, well, his gospel, he begins the story of Jesus, begins with the Godhood of Jesus Christ. He begins with that about him that we should look to and that we should admire and we should be moved by. Think of that which lights up. What do we love that lights up? Christmas trees, right? Um, there's a lot of light in a car dealership, right? <laughs> On beautiful, shiny cars. Uh, there's a lot of light in a mall, you know. We look at things that are lit up and in and, and, some of the neighborhoods that Joanne and I came from, everybody had their house lit up all the time. It's just the thing to do. Things that are lit up, things that are that um, are emphasized, right? The glory of Jesus being God. All right, 1 John 1, 5. 1 John 1, 5 says, this is the message that we heard from him and announced to you. We didn't make this stuff up. We didn't decide to start a club. We didn't decide to start a religion. We heard from God. And announce to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. This speaks of the purity of God. And so the majesty of God speaks to his beauty, that which attracts us to him as God. But the purity, this is the purity, the holiness, the otherness of God, which makes us desire him also, because he's not like us. We need him. We are in a fallen state. We need his purity. We need his holiness. We need the light to know where to go in the darkness. Finally, James 1.17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from what? The Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. God is a God of love, and he's a God of light, and Jesus is a God of light. And so, the majesty of Jesus. The second aspect of Jesus being related to light is the revelation. I hope that every time you come into this room and every time you hear my voice and every time you experience worship, there's a sense in which you connect with the God of this book. That's my mission. My mission is to paint the picture for you to help you to connect with the heart and the mind of the God of this book. When I went to church as a teenager, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, is because I wanted to hear and be in contact with the God of this book. And I did. I did that. I did that willingly. I did it because that's where I wanted to be. I didn't want to be anywhere else. I wanted to hear from my pastor because he made that connection for me. I wanted to experience worship. I wanted to give worship. I wanted to teach Bible study, which I did even as a teenager. But God is a God of revelation. Part of worship is the revelation. That when we come and when we meet with God, we don't walk away the same. We walk away going, oh, okay. There's something else I can do to be conformed to the image of Christ. I think it was Michelangelo talking about his David sculpture. That all that he did in the David sculpture was to chisel all the stuff out of the way so that David could get out type thing. We are all in the process of being perfected. We are all in the process of being finished. We are all in the process of having stuff knocked off of us that's in the way of us being conformed to the image of Christ. And regardless of how old you are, if you're on the planet, you're not done yet. There's still stuff that needs to get knocked off. 
you don't believe it, ask your husband, ask your wife, ask your kids, ask your coworkers. Somebody will tell you. Uh, after a while, you probably have to ask them not to tell you anymore because if you make the mistake of asking, they'll think it's their job to tell you and they'll tell you all the time, right? No, but Revelation, the light reveals. And James talks about the Bible being a mirror, that we look in the mirror and that we not just ignore what we see, but that we respond to what we see and make alterations as needed. If everyone in this church had woken up and not passed a mirror, we would look very different, yes? Would this be an entertaining encounter today? Would it be kind of fun in a different way? All right. Yeah, uh, we all need the mirror. And so revealing, Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. There's this sense in which being exposed to Jesus is like the sun coming up. Now, how many of you have worked late nights like me? Okay, I've worked late nights. Work. Come on. Yes, you have. <laughs> You're still waking up. Now, if you work late nights, you know what it is. You're in the dark one hour. The next hour, it's kind of dawny, but you know, can't really see. An hour later, the sun's up, and it's almost insulting because you've been in the dark, you know, and you kind of can feel it. But, but you see things differently, right? I had a rookie that I was trying to train. And there's a little road, Abrams Road, that goes down into Dallas, but goes up into Richardson. And deep nights police do not ever sleep on duty, okay? They do occasionally pray. And we hit Abrams Road, and I say, hey, take us to the station, will you? And I found myself in prayer. And I woke up, and I found myself somewhere, and I was looking at these road signs. And I said, oh, Abigail, I'll use that name because her name wasn't Abigail. But I, uh, I'll give her a pseudonym. I said, Abigail, did you, did you know that in um, Richardson, the street signs are red and they have a big R on them? And she said, yeah, why, why, do, you, why do you mention that? I said, because we're in Richardson. Turn around. Let's go back to the station. At night, she couldn't, she couldn't see. She needed glasses. And she would get us lost and almost run into things at night. But when the sun came up, she could see she was fine. And, you know, the truth is we think we can see in the dark. We do. But the truth is you cannot see in the dark like you think you can. And the Bible says that the Messiah is going to be like the sun rising. You thought you saw. Suddenly, uh, you see very differently. You see more completely, right? You see more completely. Malachi 4.2. Malachi 4.2 says, But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, watch this, not S-O-N, S-U-N, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You ever watch calves play? Okay. You ever watch animals playing, skipping about? Light is going to come. It's like the sun is coming up. You can see reality, and the result is what? Joy. Joy and playfulness. The result of a Messiah, the result of an encounter with Jesus should be joy and a carefree heart that is able to have a good time. And if y'all feel like that, I hope you do. If you don't, I hope you get like that. John 3, 19 through 21. Revealing. This is the judgment. That the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. For their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. And so the light of Jesus is revealing. It reveals to us what the truth is. It reveals to us what our relationship to him is. It also reveals what we're doing, if we're looking carefully. And it examines our work. If you're ever going to work on something, if you're ever going to try to fix something, hopefully you get it under a light, Right? If you're as old as me, you might get it under a microscope or under, you know, some readers or something so you can see the work on it or, a, you know, magnifying glass because you may need that kind of help. But it's also directive. Exodus 13, 21 is the pillar of fire. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and a pillar of fire by night to lead them that they might travel by day and by night, whether it's day or it's night, wherever you find yourself, if you find yourself in the dark, if you find yourself in the light, God has still given you a revelation that will take you to the next step. 
And so the psalm that we're very familiar with, Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path that I might not sin against God, right? He doesn't say it's a floodlight. And if you use professional lights, if you use lights as a professional, if you're using them out there at your, your cattle field at night, or if you're using it as a police officer, we got so many lumens now. I mean, just lights are so bright now. I mean, you can just light up everything, right? It's so different. And all these big light, light bars on Jeeps and trucks and cars and things, it's just amazing the light that can be produced now. But in the time that this is being written, you had a lamp. And a lamp is not a floodlight. You don't see half a mile away with a lamp. You see far enough away to take a few steps. And this book, although it has the power of anything that's powerful, we need to constantly refer to it. We need to constantly be looking at it. We need to constantly have it before us, before us, so that we know the next step, right? I hope that you have your Bible before you. Joanne's got in the habit at night. She'll tell her phone to read the Bible to her while she plays her Sudoku block killer thing at night. Whatever game she's playing, she's got the Bible being read to her at the same time. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. We need it, right? We need it. Uh, in the old days, the Bible was oracle. It wasn't written everywhere. Everyone wasn't a writer. Everyone didn't go through, you know, everyone wasn't writing their language by the time they were in third grade. The Bible was largely oracle before people were graphic. And Joanne's listening to the Bible is this very old traditional way that that used to be done. So it's revealing, it's directive, but it's also reflective. We reflect the illumination of God's glory. That word there in front of you, doxa, a uh, doxology, right? Praise God from whom all blessings flow, right? A doxology is glorifying God. Dotsa is really the way it's pronounced. Uh, there's another way that if you were to look at the Greek, there's a whole letter there that you can't see in English. Dotsa is the glory of God. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And before that, Jesus said to them in verse 14, which I didn't include here, you are the light of the world. But that light is his light that's reflected through us. And when you see the Holy Spirit come in Acts chapter 2 and there's a flame atop their head, that flame atop their head reflects the flame that became in their heart when the Holy Spirit came to be with them to live. Just like those menorah lamps. The menorah lamps had the oil within them. The fire on top was merely... Uh, burning that fuel that was within them. And for us and for them at Pentecost, people should be able to look at you and see a light in your eyes, a light on your head, and it's coming from something inside of you that is more than you, and the light in you is reflecting the literal glory of God. It's God's glory. Just like when Moses came down and the people says, we can't look at you, cover your face. And it wasn't because they are afraid of COVID. It was because literally his face shined from being in the presence of God. And when people look at you and they listen to you and they encounter you, they ought, to, they ought to see you as somebody different because you've been with God. There ought to be a gentleness. There ought to be a lovingness. There ought, there ought to be a, an authority, a moral authority, that you don't have to come uh, like, like some old school marm and hit somebody on the knuckles with a, with a stick to tell them they're wrong. They just look at you and they can see by your presence and by your example that sometimes there's something that needs to change in their life. You don't even have to say anything. It's just how you present yourself and how you react uh, to things that come your way. Similarly to the way that Joanna redirected Robert without Robert even knowing it. We can be gracious. Robert looked up. <laughs> I'm talking about you. We can be gracious. We don't have to be harsh. We can be loving. We can be creative. We don't have to be uh, harsh and judgmental and... Uh, Harsh, we don't have to. Well, the light of Jesus, it means so much, doesn't it? It means a lot. It's majestic, we should worship him. It's revealing, we should look at what he's showing us and respond to it. It's directive, we should follow that light. And it's also resulting in us being reflective of the glory of God. People should see it when they look at us. What else? The path and the progress of the justified. Look what Jesus says. He who follows, follows me, will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's talk about this for a second. That word follows is very pungent, okay? It means 
It's a word that's used of a soldier following a commander. How often do you see a military movie and a, a sergeant says to a troop or a lieutenant says to a troop, take that hill, move this over here, do that over there. How often do they go, no, nah, I'm not feeling it. Does that ever happen in the movie? If so, what happens next? Brig, court martial, you know, a beat down. <laughs> something happens, something negative. There's a negative response to that, right? You don't argue with a commanding officer in the military, particularly in battle, right? This word follow means a soldier that follows a commander. It means a slave that follows a master. It means someone seeking wise counsel, following very closely the advice of that counselor because their status and, 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 and the consequences are going to depend on how closely they follow that instruction. It's used to, to describe a believer in Christ. It's used for someone that's trying to figure out the law. You ever been in court? What's the law? What are the rules? What are we supposed to do? What are we not supposed to do? Risk management, right? What does the law say? What do we have to do to be safe? What do we have to do to, to not get in trouble? To not get in trouble with OSHA, whoever. It's used to describe following the law carefully so as to maintain the right relationship with those that, that enforce the law. It's used of a student who follows carefully his teacher. In Gamaliel and Hillel, you had two very strong teachers, and, and people were proud of studying those guys. And if you were a Hillel man or you were a, a Pillel man, there are actually three, or a Gamaliel man, you were expected to act like those teachers acted. Here we have Harvard, Harvard men and Yale men and whatever, and you hear that stuff all the time in movies, Ivy League people, right? And so this word follow is significant. He doesn't say follow like 2020 America. We've been so impacted, and, and Pirates of the Caribbean only really reflects what we've adopted as a culture. It's really more of a guideline than a rule, right? So people can commit crimes and burn down cities with zero consequences. District attorneys can say, nah, we're not going to apply the law. And then he'd be held accountable for obstruction of justice and dereliction of duty. Because they're allowing cities to be destroyed, people to be harmed, and they had blood on their hands. And I say that without hesitation. They have blood on their hands. When you allow the spirit of lawlessness to enter in, which will be the spirit of the Antichrist, and people die, and it's your responsibility to keep the peace you felt. And so we should not adopt that mentality or even tolerate it. Even in our conversations, really, there's a reason. There's a reason that we have anyway, I'll stop. He who follows me, really follows, will walk, will not walk in darkness. You can't walk in darkness and walk in the light. You can't do it. Light and darkness are mutually exclusive, and light pierces the darkness. Light dispels the darkness. You can't walk in light and walk in darkness. It's not possible. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness. In contrast, he will have the light of life. The word light there is the word phos, phosphorus. He'll have the light of life. And that, again, we're reflecting the majesty of God that's in us because of our presence with him. And that's going to that's gonna communicate in the way that we come across and the way that we demonstrate the grace of God. What have you? The letter of 1 John is really, really strong. The letter of 1 John says if we say the word God's and we're walking in sin, we're just, we're just lying. We're just not telling the truth. Now, 1 John also is a very gracious book because it says, children, I'll write these things that you don't sin, but if you do sin, you have an advocate before the Father. And if we're faithful to repent of our sins, and he's faithful not only to forgive us, but to clean us up from unrighteousness. And so you have, on one hand, a very stern letter. On the other hand, uh, you know, in 1 John, you have that grace. We're never going to be completely without sin. We're in, we're in a fallen. We're in a fallen state. We're going to sin. It's going to happen. We're not glorifying yet, okay? But it shouldn't be our heart to sin. We should not want to. The love of God, the light of God, should lead us to better things. It should lead us toward the majesty of God. And if you think about majesty, you think about when you think about royalty. Joanne gets frustrated with me sometimes. I'll have an injured leg. I'll, I'll walk. She thinks I'm walking like a, 
Neanderthal, and she'll be like, walk like a prince. Well, what does she mean like that? By that? Joanne, what do you mean by that? Upright. She wants me to walk <laughs> upright and look, you know, princely and somebody that she can look at and be attracted to and not think I'm a Neanderthal because I've hurt my knee and I've been out doing work all day. She wants me to, you know, when we think of royalty, we think of somebody a cut above, right? We think of someone that has traditions and someone that has protocol and someone that has training and someone that has self-discipline, right? And so the truth is that we're not just trying to be like that to be stuck up or to be classist or elitist or anything else. The truth is, is that when you walk with Jesus and you walk with God, he makes a difference in how you present. He makes a difference in how you respond. He makes a difference in what you love what you care about, what you promote, and the gentleness of spirit that comes with all that. This week, we had three people make professions of faith. One of them's here. Praise God for that. We're going to have someone respond to an invitation in a minute. I can't speak for the two that aren't here. I could, but I'm pretty sure about the one that is here, and I'm very thankful for that. We have our other two that recently made professions of faith. They're already in the ministry. i got one playing bongos and one doing one-armed media back there. That's someone that's following Jesus. That's someone that says yes. Not only yes, but what do I do next? Well, praise God. Poor Tom, he's trying to get his new knee broke in. He wore himself out the first straight out of surgery. I'll do it. <laughs> now he's trying to rest because he needs to rest, right? Praise God. It's joyful when we walk with God. And we see that victory, and we get a new dimension to our life. Don't you get tired of just the same old life, the same old thing, culture stuff that's just like cyclical, you know? I mean, stuff that just comes and goes, comes and goes. It's so tertiary, it's so meaningless. Nothing about Jesus Christ is meaningless. Stand with me. In Jesus, there's light. In Jesus, there's life. In Jesus, there's joy. We are free to be freed by Christ. What a what an opportunity. Man, if you're bored, if you're tired of doing the same old thing, plug into Christ. You will not be bored. I, we don't meet a lot up here in the office. We have one office day. In three days, I logged 117 miles in my truck doing ministry stuff. There's plenty to do for Jesus Christ. There's plenty of opportunity. In one day, we had three people pray a prayer to demonstrate faith in Jesus. I'm not in control of any of that. I just I was where I was supposed to be. And God's going to work out all the details of what that means. But we just need to be, there's so much available to us. And it's so awesome. I invite you today to trust Jesus to save you. I invite you today to rededicate your life to him. I invite you to turn on the light of his word and to shine it on your life and to be encouraged by it and directed by it. I invite you to be a follower and not a fan of Jesus. As we close down our Facebook invitation, if you're on Facebook, then you can message me. Get a hold of me. We'll talk. And as we begin to conclude that one, we'll have our in-house invitation. <laughs>